We've got some updates from the Red Sea in response to Houthi attacks on commercial shipping. U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin announced yesterday Operation Prosperity Guardian, which brings together multiple countries, including the U.K., Bahrain, Canada, France, Italy, the Netherlands, Norway, Seychelles, and Spain, to jointly address security challenges in the Southern Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden. Let's watch. With the lifeblood of the rules-based international order is actually seawater. All countries have the right to move freely and lawfully in international waters. But that foundational global right is under new threat today from the totally unacceptable attacks on merchant vessels by the Houthis in Yemen. So this morning, we've launched Operation Prosperity Guardian under the umbrella of Combined Maritime Forces and under the leadership of Task Force 153. That operation is bringing together more than a dozen countries from around the world to conduct joint patrols in the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden. Now, friend of the show, Dr. Trita Parsi reacted to Austin's announcement, noting not a single country on the Red Sea agreed to join the U.S. coalition to safeguard the Red Sea, and only one Arab country joined, Bahrain. What does that tell us about Biden's diplomatic pull? And as we covered yesterday, oil giant BP announced that it was suspending its trade routes. Now Taiwan's Evergreen Shipping said it is going to halt all transit through the Red Sea and will no longer accept any Israeli cargo. Evergreen is the world's sixth largest shipping firm. Five of the largest have now halted Red Sea transit. 60% of the global container fleet is now avoiding the Red Sea altogether. Here's President Biden's National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan just two weeks ago on the state of peace in the region. What we said is we want to depressurize, de-escalate, and ultimately integrate the Middle East region. The war in Yemen is in its 19 month of truce. For now, the Iranian attacks against U.S. forces have stopped. Our presence in Iraq is stable. I emphasize for now because all of that can change. And the Middle East region is quieter today than it has been in two decades. Now, ironically, working toward that peace has included getting Saudi Arabia to come to peace with Yemen. And now right. the United States of America is angling to get Saudi Arabia on board with this, it's giving Operation Iraqi Freedom, this um, Operation Prosperity Guardian, uh, which would put it at odds with these uh, Houthi fighters who, in their view, are enacting a kind of informal blockade in support of Palestine and against the ongoing siege. Right. Um, it's, uh, it's not good. I mean, this is going to massively impact. Uh, Dr. Trita Parsi said it wouldn't impact the U.S. very much so far uh, because we're um, somewhat oil and energy independent. But it will, ha it will raise um, prices uh, globally significantly, and that is a total disaster. Um, I, I think everyone's going to be frustrated being—I mean, the Red Sea is international waters. It's illegitimate for these um, the Houthi to fire on these ships. But the reality becomes, what do we do about it? Now, so now we're going to pay more to have our U.S. You know, U.S. is providing security for this region uh, for uh, for transit through this waterway. Um, that's costing us more money. Again, that's America needing to be world policemen to police this region uh, half a world away. Um, I think that's probably going to be very frustrating to a lot of American taxpayers when they think through it. And uh, and and yes, it's you know where are our allies in this in this region? What has come of our diplomacy, our outreach to the Arab world? If when push comes to shove, nobody's on board for our project. Yeah, I think what's happening is that you have a lot of leaders in a lot of these Arab nations who are perfectly happy to go along with the normalization efforts with Israel and with the West that have been ongoing up until the conflict basically basically emerged in October. 7th. But at this point, even though I think that they would largely still be aligned with that effort, their populations right. are furious over the treatment of Behind Palestinians. Behind closed doors, they're totally, uh, the leadership is still completely on board. In, and in fact, groups like Hamas and Hezbollah and the Houthis are inconvenient for them, and they wish they could magically make them disappear. But their people don't feel that way. Yeah, the, the, the bulk of people in the Arab world are 
horrified by what they see in Gaza. We're at um, 10,000 child deaths alone was the number that was just hit over the last 24 hours or so. And they're seeing this as emblematic of the West's long-term treatment of Arabs and, dis, you know, and disregard for the value of their lives. And so the leaders of these nations are being are between a rock and a hard place and are trying to sit this one out, even as the United States are trying to pull a country like Saudi Arabia into an antagonistic relationship, a direct antagonistic relationship with Yemen again. And so the question I think that you raise is a good one. The world is going to suffer from higher oil costs. These ships are going to have to go all the way around the Horn of Africa, which is like I think three, takes three times longer and is more expensive and more dangerous um, for sailing conditions and a whole lot of other reasons. So how much this is the question that's presenting to the world? A similar question that was presented to Ukraine when the harvests were interrupted, Ukraine, the grain basket of the global south and all that sort of thing. How much is the world expected to pay for the policy decisions of the United States of America? How much is the world expected to pay because Israel is making a decision to continue a siege now two months out from a horrific event of October 7th, in which they've killed multitudes more of people, 20 times more people than died now on October 7th. How much longer does this have to go, and how, how, why, does it, why is it always the case, seemingly, that the global South and the rest of the world has to be inconvenienced because of the United States' choice to, for well, instance, veto these UN resolutions for a ceasefire? Yeah, I, I mean, it's... To be clear, though, it's mostly a policy choice by the state of Israel, not by the United States. I mean, we we don't have to continue supporting them or giving money. Again, I would cut that off in, independent of the situation. But given the total support in Israel for continuing this um, war against Hamas, I have very little doubt that it would continue, even, even absent greater U.S. support. Well, I guess my feeling is that since uh, the U.S. gives Israel more aid than any other country in the world, that it is upping that aid amount in, in the wake of October 7th, that the bombs that are being dropped are bombs that are procured from the United States of America, that America is giving Israel diplomatic cover in the UN, preventing it from having um, uh, to come before the International Criminal Court and have investigations into the war crimes that have been alleged, uh, that but for the U.S.'s financial and political support, Israel could not implement the siege that has been implementing on Gaza and, moreover, could not defend itself against an aligned Arab world that is clearly willing to step in in the ways that it can and defend the interests of Palestinians in the ways that it can. And that's what we're seeing play out in the Red Sea. Yeah. I mean, Israel has won wars against, you know, these countries throughout its entire history and has the will and the might to continue. I, I mean, we're not disagreeing. I would not fund this effort any longer. It's clearly harming our own national security interests. It's looping the U.S. into something that is really not our business, the same way Ukraine is. Um, but I, I have, we can't, I, I, again, I, I don't think the U.S. should be the world's policeman, neither for or against this conflict or any other. This is a dispute. This is a regional dispute between two governing uh, groups that hate each other, have good reason to hate each other, frankly, given everything that has occurred. And I see that likely to continue, and the best we can do is try to stay out of it. Well, I think you can't really have it both ways, right? Either we give Israel that much support because they need it, they wouldn't be able— what, what are the arguments that are made around Iron Dome funding? That if you don't fund the Iron Dome, Israel's going to be— Hit well, that's the interest group trying to get bombs. more money out of that. All right, but it. you can't have it both ways. <laughs> well, I'm either, not having it both ways. Either, either Israel cannot persist without uh, American funding, and that's why they lean so hard on AOC and she's crying on the House floor over the Iron Dome mm -hmm. votes, or it's an amazing, courageous, brave nation that can defend itself, in which case, why are we involved at all? Well, right. Lobbyists are always saying, my, my issue will be defeated and destroyed unless you give me more money, but, you know, that's a— that's a plea for funds, right? That's uh, uh, that's the donors um, donors um, imposition for more money. All right. Well, we will definitely continue to follow this, including some real, I think, problems that the Israeli military is experiencing in their ground game, really putting to test the quality of their uh, ability to uh, do uh, ground incursions going forward. Do stick around. More rising after this.